Today, we're gonna to be talking about everything seminal pumpkin. Scientific name, Turkabita moshada. Plus, be answering lots of your questions. This is set this right here. It's got pumpkins all around me. And that brings us to the first question slash comment from Vicky. She is totally new to growing seminal pumpkins and she wants to know everything that she can learn to have a successful harvest. So let's talk a little bit of the basics of seminal pumpkins. Actually, first let's talk one of the most basic things to seminal pumpkins because honestly, there's no point in learning about seminal pumpkins if you're not gonna eat them. So let's first talk about how do seminal pumpkins taste? The seminal pumpkins taste a lot like butternut squash. Which makes sense because they're part of the same set of pumpkin cultivars slash squash cultivars that basically make up seminal pumpkins, butternut squash, and calabasa pumpkins. So now you're interested in growing seminal pumpkins, but you may have the same question as David, which is how does seminal pumpkin do in things like zone 9 and zone 10? From the Calusa to the Creek to the Miccosukee tribe of South Florida, so many indigenous people of the southeast grew seminal pumpkins for hundreds and hundreds of years and they grew them in zone 9, zone 10, and actually all the way up to states like Pennsylvania. We actually have areas in Florida like Chassahowitza, which is in the southwest portion of Florida. That would be a zone 10, which is hot and humid. And Chassahowitza actually translates into hanging pumpkins or the hanging pumpkin place. This actually has to do with the historical practice that our indigenous tribes of Florida and other places did with our seminal pumpkins, which is they used to let the vines actually run up dead oak trees and then allow the pumpkins to just hang there. And so this is actually one of the reasons why you'll get different shaped pumpkins is it actually has to do with what kind of growing conditions. If you grow them on the ground, <laughs> They'll look more like this, more classic pumpkin shape, but if they're hanging, they can look more like this. But this shape isn't necessarily just due to hanging. Sometimes it will grow this way even on the ground. As the differences in shapes that you can get with seminal pumpkin, you also can get quite a bit of variety in size. Typically places like University of Florida will say that these can be six to 12 pounds. What I've often find is they're closer somewhere between one and six pounds. What's also great about seminal pumpkin is that even though you may end up with tons and tons of pumpkins, you don't have to eat them all right away. You could store them inside your house and that would extend the life of this pumpkin much further, anywhere from six to 12 months. And honestly, all these pumpkins in the basket back here, they're all over a year old. And when it comes to collecting our seminal pumpkins, you don't just have to eat them when they become fully mature. You can actually eat other parts of the pumpkin slash even early. Green pumpkins can actually be eaten raw. And of course, similar to many other types of pumpkins and squashes, you can of course eat both the male and female flowers. Legitimately, there's so many pumpkins around me and I don't mean the ones I've harvested, but there are a bunch that, <laughs> but they're, <laughs> they're all like, my knee is on one. There's so many and you guys can't even really see them. <laughs> now let's talk about how do you grow seminal pumpkins? Where do you grow seminal pumpkins? The basics of starting seeds for seminal pumpkins and placing them. Now, when you go ahead and you put a seed in for seminal pumpkin, it takes about seven to 12 days for it to germinate. But a lot of people I know we get focused on, we put a seed in and then like, where, where's my plant? But one of the things you really need to think about is seminal pumpkin is a subtropical squash slash pumpkin and it likes the heat, which may not be the case with so many other vegetables. So this might have thrown us off. Oftentimes with pumpkin plants, they will not germinate their seeds until it's above 80 degrees. So even though you've put some seeds in the ground, if it's still too cold out, they will hang out. But once it starts to get into those warmer temperatures in the 70s and 80s, you'll find that your pumpkin seed comes up pretty quickly. Where and how do you place your seminal pumpkin? So when it comes to growing a seminal pumpkin, you're gonna wanna space these out quite a bit. You wanna do them at least four feet apart in rows six to nine feet apart. Now, when it comes from seed to when you're gonna be able to harvest, it's usually about 120, 140 days. But this is also gonna be important if you do get frost in your area, you do wanna make sure that you plant your seeds at least three months ahead of time. But how many seeds should you put into the ground in a single location or in a pot or in a container to get it going? The typical rule of thumb when it comes to pumpkins and squashes is no more than three. These usually have a really, really good germination rate. So you don't need to go and put like a hundred seeds in one little spot. Three is plenty. And when it comes to the depth of the seed, no more than an inch. And if you're thinking, how deep is that? It's about as deep as this part of your thumb. Now, one of the things is once your plant does take off, if you are gonna do it on the ground, is that you do need space for it to produce both male and female flowers. When it comes to male and female flowers, they are different. I've been wondering for your pumpkin, is that a male flower or a female flower? Here are a couple things to look for to know the difference. One is the size of a male flower. They're much smaller than the female flowers. You can see by a significant amount. 
The second thing to look for is the males will just have the stem and then it'll go straight to the flower. Versus the female flower, you'll notice a fruit right below. The third thing is, is that male flowers show up first on a vine and they'll usually put out many male flowers before you will eventually get a female flower. Even if you get a female flower, it doesn't mean that the plant will keep the fruit. Oftentimes after they drop the flower, they drop the fruit. And now you know what to look for in preparation for a pumpkin. So you'll often want to do more than one plant so that you have the ability for your female flowers to be pollinated without missing out on the season. Which brings us to Sandy's question. Sandy wants to know where can I buy seeds if I want to grow seminal pumpkin? Now you can use online resources like I have bought seeds from Southern Exposure or you can use places like Baker Creek for seeds. There are many at-home growers. I also got seeds from David the Good's daughter, Daisy the Good, on her Etsy shot. Plus, so many other people are selling seminal pumpkin seeds because once you get seminal pumpkin, well, it really can take off and you will have lots of pumpkin and therefore lots of pumpkin seeds. But Howdy's asking, well, I ordered some seeds from Baker Creek and they say seminal squash. Is that the same thing? Yes, seminal squash is seminal pumpkins because all pumpkins, no matter what variety, are squashes though all squashes are not pumpkins. Think things like zucchini and summer squash. But yes, our seminal pumpkins are a type of squash. So if a package does say seminal squash, you are correct. And actually seminal pumpkins are what we call crookneck pumpkins. That's the type of family that they grow from. And they can take actually a variety of different shapes. So you can get very tiny ones like this little guy that I just picked the other day, or they can be more teardrop shaped like this one, or because they're out of that crookneck family, they may actually have a little bit of a neck like you see with a butternut squash. And because Seminole pumpkin and butternut squash came out of the same family slash species slash cultivar, they can actually cross pollinate with things like butternut squash and calabaza pumpkins, which means that someone may have a new hybridized type of squash slash pumpkin. That's a mix between the butternut and the seminal pumpkin, which is one of the things you should be thinking about when you go and buy seeds is, is it a true seminal pumpkin or potentially a mix between a butternut squash, calabaza, or any combination thereof. Now here's the question. What's the ideal place to go and put your seminal pumpkin? And can you grow it in a pot? So Sherry was asking what size container would be the best container for growing a seminal pumpkin. Now this seminal pumpkin right here, I did not plant here, not least purposely. I was growing potatoes, I used my compost and voila, here comes a seminal pumpkin. But as you can see, it's not the happiest plant. When it comes to seminal pumpkins, they like to run. A typical seminal pumpkin plant grows 25 feet long. And one of the ways that seminal pumpkin is able to survive through a lot of different harsh weather conditions and survive the subtropics and the tropics is actually through rerouting along its nodes. Any of these little locations right here, they're able to reroot, and that's a way that they're able to then deal with a lot of the stresses that Florida and other subtropical locations put on them. And while you may be able to get a seminal pumpkin to take off inside of a container, it really isn't going to have the space to grow unless you do like what Ben is asking here, which is you go and you try to run it up a trellis. So you may be able to work in a container with a seminal pumpkin or in a small garden bed, like Kathleen is asking, like a four by four bed. If you're gonna do something with a bed that small, you're gonna wanna have a trellis available to run them up. If you're gonna do a container, I would try to do whiskey barrel size just to give the ability for this plant to put in some pretty decent sized roots. They can go down, I think 18 inches. So having something with some depth would be very helpful. Now, Ben is asking, how do you get it to go up a trellis or maybe a tree? It's really as straightforward as like, you just, you kind of like pick up the vine and you like, just like put it up there <laughs> and try to wind it through a little bit. Once you kind of get it on there, you could tie it with a little bit of string. You want to do it very loosely, very loosely, just to get it started. It does, it is a vining plant that actually can move upwards and it does have its little, like those little spirally parts of the vine. So it will cling to things as it goes along. Trust me, I've had many of plants I've had to accidentally rip out as I move a vine. <laughs> But you may find that your vine doesn't actually want to climb up the trellis. I had this issue when I first started growing some of the pumpkin. One of the biggest reasons is that if the trellis has a little bit too much shade on it and the ground doesn't, the seminal pumpkin is going to keep trying to go back to the ground. It's going to follow the sun because it does like sun, even the intense sun down here in the subtropics. Now, Ben was also asking about what can you do if a vine gets broken? Can, is there a way to heal them? Now, I do not know if there's a way to specifically heal them. If you know, go ahead and put that in the comments down below. But I did want to show you this plant right here. 
when my husband and I were moving vines around because we wanted to plant some pretty flowers, what ended up happening is we accidentally broke the vine on this pumpkin right here, which at the time was very immature and very green. And you can see, I mean, uh-oh, did I just break it again? <laughs> you can see this one actually was able to get all the way to maturity, no problem. And you can see the stem, well, well I guess I just finally lost it, is green all the way till now. So, and that was about two months ago. So even just having partial stem is gonna allow the plant to keep going. Now Steph was asking, can you just put your pumpkin plant in like a nice bed and then let the vines go running out of it over some places like maybe some oak leaves? And absolutely, yes, completely recommend. Use your classic bed space to do other vegetables like tomatoes and peppers and all sorts of other goodies. And let your pumpkins use up space that you don't need to step on regularly, <laughs> but that you can allow it to spread and do its thing. But honestly, I find that it's way better to allow some of the pumpkin to run along the ground, even not within vegetables beds. My vegetable bed ends way back there, and this pumpkin goes all sorts of directions. As long as the seminal pumpkin can reroot, it will keep going. What you'll often find, and this is an area, is like a perfect example, is as your seminal pumpkins are getting ready to be harvested, all the leaves around it will die back even in the heat of summer and all the other times of year, it's not like up north where basically the pumpkin grows through the summer and then dies back at first frost. It will basically die back as the seminal pumpkin fruit, AKA the pumpkin is ready. And so if you allow the plant to allow it to keep going, it'll just pick a different direction beyond wherever it's recently noted. Let me just show you. I think it'll make more sense if I show you what's going on. So you can see this area here where these pumpkins are basically ready and you can see the vine has been dying. So you can see this vine right here has been dying back. And then you can see that the vine is still green and going and now we have leaves again that look a little bit sadder. But as we keep going, the leaves are getting better and better. Here's a really good example. This pumpkin is finally ready and you can see all the leaves have started to die off. And if I go looking for its original vine, it probably came from that direction, but it's basically died off that way. But if we look, we can see we have a green vine going and going and going and going and boom. Now we have really healthy leaves and flowers starting to come out of this section. So as you can see, by allowing the seminal pumpkin to run around the garden, it actually allows it to produce multiple harvests and multiple waves of harvest throughout the year. And potentially, depending on your climate, may allow it to even go through the summer into the following year. So we've talked about some specific questions that other people have, but Anna just wants to know, so where do you have all the options? Where should you plant your seminal pumpkins? Well, when it comes to seminal pumpkins, seminal pumpkins like full sun. University of Florida recommends the full like eight hours including here in Florida with very, very intense sun. Though I know some people said that in full intense sun that they found that their pumpkins didn't do so great. For me, I have grown my seminal pumpkins for two, three years now in semi-shade. So in my garden, my pumpkins actually get about mm, three, four hours of full sun throughout each day, all throughout the year, whether we're in summer or winter. This partially could be why some of my seminal pumpkins are on the smaller side and you, if you give it more sun during the day, would be able to. But what I do find is in the really strong heat of the summer is that the leaves do get droopy. So an area that does get a little bit of shade wouldn't hurt it. So maybe if you're in the six hour, four hour range, you're still going to have a lot of really good harvest. But Anna also asked, she said, I've had seminal pumpkins, but she's not getting the pollinators. So how do you bring pollinators to seminal pumpkins? So in order to be able to get a seminal pumpkin harvest, you need both a male and a female flower. And these flowers are pretty big with the males being about this big and the female flowers being as big <laughs> as my extended hand. And when it comes to really, really large squash flowers, the best pollinator is actually bumblebees and carpenter bees. These are really big fat bees that do really, really well at pollinating squashes. And there are a few, especially native flowers that really, really do a good job at attracting those bees to the garden, plus lots of other small ones too. And this area is a perfect example of a great combination for your seminal pumpkins. Down as a ground cover, I have sunshine mimosa, and these native flowers are excellent at attracting large bumblebees. 
you can see another native plant. This is dotted horseman, also called spotted bee balm. Another plant that once the bracts turn white and it turns pale pinkish purple, it's gonna be a really, really good way of attracting our pollinators to the garden. And by putting it right near where the plant is flowering, I'm ensuring that I have a steady supply of bees, whether it's gonna be my big bumblebees or a tinier kind of your classic honeybee sweat bee. And when it comes to keeping a real steady supply of bees and pollinators to the garden, if you have limited space for planting native plants or flowers to bring them in, I highly recommend Minothera nivea is a really, really great plant for pulling in tons and tons of pollinators and it doesn't take up a lot of space. So you may wanna add this dotted horse mint or sunshine mimosa near your pumpkins to increase your harvest. So you may be like Emily who actually has grown some of the pumpkins and honestly just wanted to let people know that when you do plant some of the pumpkins, you may have so many, but you actually have to give some away. <laughs> and that may be the case. With my three plants that I started three years ago, I actually had 90 pounds last year of seminal pumpkins. So you can end up with a lot. So you've put your seminal pumpkin in a great place. You've brought in lots of pollinators. You have seminal pumpkins growing, but now you may have the question like Marilyn, which is how do you know it's time to harvest? So you may have been staring at your pumpkin like Marilyn and thinking, is this ready? How shall I know it's ready? So one of the earliest signs is that I start to see the leaves dying back and actually revealing the plant. So if you start to see your leaves looking sad and you're worried about a pest, it actually could mean that the plant is just putting energy into finishing off the pumpkin versus these leaves, which are looking pretty good and are probably related to this pumpkin right here. The second thing that you can also look for is of course color. These pumpkins are not going to be orange. They're more of this tan, basically look a lot like butternut squash. So they're in this tannish range. And once you see that, you're good to go. Now, what do you do if the pumpkin's like this? What if you need to harvest, let's say there's a storm coming, a frost coming, whatever, some reason, and you go, I need to get this pumpkin in, but it's still a little bit green. Well, one, when you go to harvest, no matter whether it looks fully mature or not, you should always cut the stem as far away from the pumpkin as possible. I like to cut them right below the node right here. So the node is basically this intersection of vine, incoming, outgoing, and usually a leaf like this right here. So the closer you can cut, even if it's a little green, it will finish maturing off the vine. Many of these pumpkins that I harvested originally had a little bit of green either on the underside or like this little one. I was moving the vine right as it was very close to the end and this bottom was actually still green. But here we are a month later and it's totally orange. Now, does it matter if you have a long stem, a medium stem or a short stem or how about no stem at all? And the answer is yes. Yes, it will. That's gonna basically directly lead to how fast or how slow this plant will be need to be used. Basically, if there's no stem, there's easy ways for funguses, bacteria to get inside of your pumpkin and start causing it to rot sooner than later. So if for some reason you have a pumpkin where the stem came off and it happens from time to time, just make sure that you use those pumpkins first. Now I go for longer to medium stems, medium stems being like two, two and a half inches long. If you do that and then allow this to dry out, you can store these up to a year inside your house if you're air conditioned. <sighs> it's getting hot out, I need to move back in the shade. So let's talk about, you've got all these pumpkins, what do you do with them? Now, as you're harvesting your pumpkins, you may find that some of them are really small. And like Sherry may ask, why are my seminal pumpkins so small? Now there are a variety of factors that can impact it from availability of sun, like in my garden, or it could also be availability of water, the heat, how humid it is, the intensity of the sun, pest pressure, nutrition in the ground, all these things. Usually a sign of a small fruit or a small pumpkin just means it has too much or too little of something it wants. So let's talk about sun. How much sun and how do you kind of figure it out? Well, we talked about University of Florida recommends eight to 10 hours to sun for seminal pumpkins. But remember, this pumpkin ranges from Pennsylvania all the way down to South Florida. That's a really wide range with a really big difference in sun intensity. So here in zone 10A, which is about 27 degrees north of the equator, and don't worry if you don't really know that, where you are exactly versus the equator, but we can usually use zones to kind of figure out. I told you guys that I can do three, four hours because I have a really intense sun. And down in South Florida, it's gonna be even a little bit more intense. So they may be able to get away with four hours of sun, five hours of sun, six hours of sun. But 
if you lived in South Florida and you gave it a full eight hours of sun, it may be too stressed out because of the intensity of the sun. But vice versa, if you lived in North Florida or maybe you live in Georgia, Alabama, the Carolinas, and you're giving it only three hours of sun like I am, you'll probably find that your pumpkin isn't happy. Now, when it comes to my Floridians and fertilizing and nutrition, well, we know that we tend to have sandy soil. And if you're like Steph earlier who wanted to let it grow across an open area of oak leaves, you may find that the soil is a little too acidic, a little too sandy, and not have enough nutrition in it for your pumpkin. Because your pumpkin is going to basically want your standard kind of like vegetable garden mixed type soil. That's what it's going to grow best in. The way I've done it is I mulched and mulched and mulched and mulched kind of back to Eden method to give a lot of nutrition throughout the space so my pumpkins can run around wherever they want and they, they get what they need. When it comes to watering your soil, of course, this goes back to depending where you live, you may be giving too much or too little. Lots of the southeast of the country goes through a drought season, especially in our cooler months, but we may have the heat to actually get the plant started. But if you're like people in North Florida, Central Florida, who will grow this through the summer, you may find that you're getting too much water if your soil doesn't drain really well in the summer months because we go through monsoon season. So you want your soil to be moist, to slightly dry, but not a swamp and not a desert. That's what a pumpkin will like best. So check those things to see if those are the things that are stressing it out. And then of course, keep your eye out for pests. So Community Gardening of Hope was asking, how do you use your seminal pumpkins? What dishes do you use them in? They use them powdered. For me, there's kind of two main dishes that we typically use ours in. One, we do kind of like a baked butternut squash and then Ben puts in like a, my husband Ben, <laughs> puts in like a Southwest Tex-Mex type rice and beans, salsa, cheese, guac kind of thing. It's really yummy. And then the other big dish, which you guys have heard me talk about a lot on this channel, which is basically a fettuccine alfredo, but it is a seminal pumpkin fettuccine alfredo, where basically we take a pumpkin puree and add it in with our alfredo sauce. It's super yummy. Then we put fresh Everglades tomatoes on it, and then maybe sometimes some fresh broccoli out of the garden. Yummy, 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 yummy. Love this dish. Actually gonna have this weekend. So we talked about where to plant it. We've talked about how to plant it, ways to troubleshoot it, but when was the right time to grow it? Feeding My Florida Soul wants to know what's the right time of year to grow this plant. And it depends. It depends where you live. So for me here in central slash South Florida, I'm technically not in South Florida, but where I live acts like South Florida, so we'll go with it. It would be between August and March would be some of the best times of year because we really never get that cold down here in Zone 10A. But if you lived in the areas of Central Florida that actually get a lot colder than what I do, or you live in North Florida, your best time of year is somewhere between March and July. But what it really comes down to is temperature. So if you live in Pennsylvania, you live over in Texas or anywhere between there and Florida, really what you need to think about is temperature. Seminal pumpkins like it warm. They like it hot. Eating my Florida soul also asked, how many plants do I need? I am a family of five, so how many should I grow to feed them? And of course the answer is, it depends. <laughs> It depends how much do you want to eat seminal pumpkin, how much of your diet is going to be seminal pumpkin. But I will tell you with three vines that we're running and 90 pounds of pumpkins, a family of four, we haven't even gotten through last year's crop. But if we made this more of our dishes, you know, it could go a lot faster. Now let's give a little bit more idea because if you start thinking about how many pounds will equal how many dishes, a typical six pound pumpkin I found actually created four meals. So you would between a family of four use that in one night. So we can say that for every six pounds, we get about one night worth of food. So with about 90 pounds of pumpkins from three plants, then we can basically have a pumpkin meal every single month for the entire family. And if you wanna break down that math a little bit more, about one plant is gonna equal about, for me and my conditions, about 30 pounds of pumpkins. But when we look at dishes like that pumpkin fettuccine Alfredo, it uses way less pumpkin and we have tons of puree. And since we love to use that a lot, that only uses like a cup, maybe two cups of puree. It's not a lot. But now at least you have the numbers so you can figure out how often do you wanna eat it with your family numbers and then go calculate how many plants. But on the reverse side, we have Mitchell who asks, I got 12 to 20 female flowers a week. Is there a certain point at which it becomes diminishing returns to how many plants you're gonna plant? Now it comes back to, it depends. It depends how much pumpkin you wanna eat. If you don't wanna eat a lot of pumpkin, it sounds like you might end up with a lot. But before you go ripping out your plants, I would really wait to see how many of your female flowers 
actually get pollinated. You will find with female flowers, you'll see the little fruit on there. You may see pollinators hanging around, but you still may see that your seminal pumpkins completely abort that fruit and don't actually bring it to full maturity. After you see the female flower, I would wait one, maybe two weeks to see how many mature fruits you actually have that are actually growing before I would consider ripping out a plant. But Mitchell also said that his seminal pumpkins have long escaped his vegetable beds and are running through his St. Augustine grass. Is there any pests or problems he needs to watch out for? Well, one of the first things that came to my mind before I even got the pests is you said it was running into your grass. And as someone who originally grew pumpkins in her grass, I will tell you it becomes very, very pesky to find your pumpkins amidst grass when you can't mow it. And you cannot mow it once the pumpkins are running through it unless you want to kill your pumpkins, which brings up some of the challenges of letting it grow through your grass. Because once you're unable to grow your grass and your pumpkins are running through it and your grass gets very tall looking, which is totally fine from that perspective, I'm not worried about the look as much as it is at trapping moisture, which if you don't water your lawn, fine. But if you do water your lawn, you're gonna end up causing a lot of issues that have to do with like funguses growing on your leaves, which can stress out your plant and make it more susceptible to other pests and diseases. So something to think about is because that some of that St. Augustine grass can get really, really tall is how are you gonna keep it kind of trapped and away from the leaves? Now it's not the end of the world because clearly I grow my pumpkins through sunshine mimosa, but sunshine mimosa, unlike St. Augustine grass, is gonna top out at about six inches. So there is still a little bit of airflow around the leaves, though not as much as they would ideally like. Brings us to Julie Ann's question, which is what are some of the pests that we might run into? I think overall, one of the biggest issues a lot of people will run into is different funguses that can run into their pumpkin. Especially here in Florida, we have so much moisture, so much humidity, and because many Floridians will grow this through the summer, we have a lot of rain. Summer is the monsoon season for Florida, and that means we get six inches, nine inches of rain with weekends where we can have five inches of rain. And because we have so much moisture in the area, like I said, fungal issues, but specifically the issue that affects most squashes, cucumber varieties, melon varieties in Florida is called gummy stem blight. Another name you may know by is black rot. And your best protection against it is actually going to be allowing those leaves to get a lot of air around them or just kind of once you see it coming in just get rid of the plant when it comes to other things that might attack your pumpkin slash attack the plant we get into kind of the typical ones which a few of our commenters have actually run into karen b a longtime follower of this channel well she ran into small green bugs which my guess is is it with some type of caterpillar which is not uncommon or Maria who ran into a bunch of black bugs. When it comes to plants that are stressed out, bugs really do come in, especially your caterpillar types from different types of moths or your other types of bugs will just come and bring themselves in. Even one of mine, I had a plant that got too much moisture trapped around it between a log and some of the other plants around it and the millipede started eating it because the bottom part got too soft. Was it the millipede that killed it at the end of the day? No, it was the fact that it was a stretched out pumpkin because of too much moisture. And Karen B also asked, what kind of fertilizer should we be using for our seminal pumpkins? And honestly, seminal pumpkins aren't very different from anything like peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, corn, a lot of the classic types of vegetable crops. They're looking for the same kind of NKP, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So any of the things that you would use in a typical vegetable garden are what we're looking for for seminal pumpkins. You can use anything from doing a back to Eden method like I did, just putting down tons of mulch. You could add your classic cow manure compost or like many Floridians like to do is dig holes and then go ahead and put some fish in it. Like Emily here said that she went and put compost in the original hole where she planted her seeds. And then later after her husband caught some fish, they put the fish heads in along the way to keep the plant going. Other than doing back to Eden method in my garden, I don't add anything additional to my seminal pumpkins and we're getting a ton. <laughs> well, we've answered a lot of questions about seminal pumpkins, but you may be wondering what are some other easy plants to grow here in Florida or in the subtropics? Go ahead and check out this video right here. Okay, I'll see you soon. Bye.